American people, I'm Bethany Van Delft, and welcome to a very presidential episode of The 10 News, the show where, in the time it takes you to make sure your adults are registered to vote, we find out what's up in the world. Today, it's the election stuff the grown-ups are talking about, explained, and way more fun. In today's episode, we'll learn about presidential debates, find out how to get elected president, and get the inside scoop on what it takes to be president. Hold on to your ballot boxes. Now, let's get into the 10. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. It's October, and if you're running for president, that can only mean one thing. Debate! where people running for office are asked a lot of tough questions to help voters decide who they want to be president. On Tuesday, we saw the first debate between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, who will face off in a total of three different debates before Election Day on November 3rd. It takes a lot of work to get ready. It's like studying for a really important test, except the candidates hire teams of people to help them explain their position on issues like healthcare, the economy, and education to an audience of millions online and on TV. They even have people on their staff play their opponents so they can practice. I did my best. What did you say? I said I did my best. Some candidates spend weeks preparing for a debate. It's one of the few times the candidates will meet each other face-to-face during the campaign. But why do candidates debate at all? Well, the idea comes from a series of debates from the 1850s called the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Abraham Lincoln was running for Senate against his opponent, Stephen Douglas. Douglas would give a campaign speech in one city, and a few days later, Lincoln would show up and give his. Eventually, they thought it would be easier to just meet in the same place at the same time and have a debate. They held a total of seven, and each was three hours long. What? It took a while for the idea to catch on, like about 100 years. But in 1952, when the presidential campaigns started to use TV to deliver their message to voters, things changed. It was the 1960 debates between John F. Kennedy, then senator from Massachusetts, and Vice President Richard Nixon that cemented the debate's place in picking a president of the United States. People who listened to that first debate on the radio thought Nixon had won. But historians said the people watching on TV picked Kennedy as the winner. On television, Nixon looked sick and tired, while Kennedy looked young and energetic. So that by the year 1970, the United States is ahead in education. They debated three more times, but Nixon lost the election to Kennedy. After that, the debates became a game changer in elections. It's time for your trivia question of the day. In 2016, when the public was asked to vote on the name of a $300 million state-of-the-art polar research ship, what name did they choose? A, the Henry Worsley. B, the Great Unsinkable. C, Bodie McBoatface. Stick around till the end of the 10 to find out. We are counting down to election day. It's just around the corner, people. Two candidates battling it out for votes until one emerges as the next president of the United States. But how exactly did we get here? What are the steps to becoming president? We asked some friends to help us explain. Take it away, friends. How to become president of the United States. Step one, the nomination. A political party is made up of people with the same ideas about how the government should work. The race for president is usually between the two biggest parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. After voting on it, each party picks one person to run as their candidate and announces their formal nomination at a big gathering called a national convention. This is also where the nominee chooses their running mate, the vice presidential candidate. Step two, the general election. 
The candidates campaign all over the country trying to win the votes of the American people by the first no, Tuesday in November, Election Day. Voters in every state cast their ballots for one president and vice president. Does the candidate with the most votes win? It's not quite that simple. Step three, the Electoral College. When the general population casts their votes, they're voting for a group of people called electors. Each state gets a certain number of electors in what's known as the Electoral College system. After the general election, each elector casts one electoral vote. There are 538 electoral votes in total, so the candidate who gets more than half, or 270, wins the election. Big thanks to Miles, Logos, and Ellie for helping us understand the road to the presidency. It's important to note that especially this year, when so many people will be mailing in their ballots to avoid crowds on election day, it may take a while to count up all the votes to be sure who won. We'll just have to be patient. The job of leading our nation is super important and a pretty tough job to get. Our correspondent, Pamela Kirkland, spoke with a guest who knows all about what it takes to be president. We have a very special guest with us today, and he knows a lot about politics, probably best known for making political candidates successful. In fact, he helped Bill Clinton become president. And on top of that, he co-hosts a podcast with Al Hunt called 2020 Politics War Room. James Carville, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, good. I'm, I'm delighted to be on the show. I'd love to have you talk about what you do and what you're known for, which is winning campaigns. But what I'm known for and what my passion in life has been is running political campaigns, not just in the United States, but around the world. I've, I've, I've represented 14 different heads of state. And, uh, you know, my first, you know, love outside of my family is politics. What makes a good president? So I was President Clinton. We had like the 20th year anniversary or the 25th year anniversary in Little Rock. And President Clinton was shaking everybody's hand. And she said, uh, Mr. President, this is my daughter. And he said, she's. 13, and she wants to be president, what advice do you have for her? And he said, two things. Study hard and meet as many people as you can that are not like you. That's the best political advice I have ever heard for a young person, is study hard and at the end of the day, ask yourself, how many people did I encounter that were not like me? Because if you go through life hanging out with just people that are like you, you're not going to have the kind of understanding of other people that is essential if you want to build a coalition to run for office. I think that's really essential advice. I'm sure you've had, you know, many people approach you and say, hey, I'd like to be president. And I'm sure you didn't say yes to all of them. In your mind, what makes a good presidential candidate? What you want to do, if you have political aspirations, you want to Put yourself in a position to succeed. You look for opportunities. And when they present themselves, you seize them. And you know, most times you got to be prepared for the fact that a lot of them, you're going to try and it's not going to work out. And you, you try something else. Look at Joe Biden. This is his third time. He's 76 years old. 77. People talk about his stamina. They don't know how much stamina this guy's got. You can make a difference in people's lives and maybe you'll never be president but you're still going to make a difference in people's lives. If you want to do this, that is great. I, I'm so for you, and I still want you to succeed. But understand that failure is going to be part of this, too. Abraham Lincoln was a stunningly good politician and understood politics, understood the application and uses of power. And by the way, lost a lot, too. I, I could argue that Abraham Lincoln, you know, is, it's at, it is both at the same time the greatest winner in the history of American politics and the greatest loser in the history of American politics. That's another bit of advice that you just gave. I mean, reading the history and biographies of some of the great former presidents that there are. Yeah. I've known successful people, and there's, there's one single trait that they all have. And it's not intelligence. To some extent, it's not even charisma. The real thing that they have in common is a deep sense of curiosity. They're curious people. And, you know, if you want to be successful, you have to be curious and curious about a lot of things. 
and looking forward to November 3rd in the general election, I mean, what would you tell kids to watch for? Make sure your parents vote. Make sure your friends' parents vote. Make sure your, your older brother or sister, if they're over 18, vote. Make sure your grandparents vote. Make sure the people down the block vote. Kind of be not annoying, but, but you know, please, I'm a young person. Vote because it matters a lot to me. What incredible advice for young people. Study hard, and at the end of the day, ask yourself, how many people did I encounter who are not like me? Remember our trivia question from earlier in the show? In 2016, when the public was asked to help name a $300 million state-of-the-art polar research ship, what did they name it? Was it the Henry Worsley, the Great Unsinkable, or Bodie McBoatface. So did you guess it? The answer is... Bodie McBoatface! I know it's ridiculous, but I just love it! The name was first proposed by a British radio presenter as a joke, but clearly people found it really funny, and it quickly became the top choice in the poll. Even though Bodie McBoatface won the popular vote, the name was not used for the research mothership, which was ultimately named Sir David Attenborough. However, the lead long-range auto sub carried aboard the Sir David Attenborough is, in fact, named, you guessed it, Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> well, time's up. That's the end of the 10 for today. You can catch new episodes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The 10 News is a co-production of Small But Mighty Media in collaboration with Next Chapter Podcasts and distributed by iHeartRadio. The 10 News writing team is led by editorial director Tracy Crooks with contributions from Pamela Kirkland and Stephen Tompkins. The creative producer is Jenner Pasqua. Marketing is led by Jacob Bronstein with social media and web support by Bryn Jura and Adam Farr. Editing and sound design by Edgar Camay and Greg Cortez under the production direction of Jeremiah Tittle. Executive producers Donald Albright and show creator Tracy Leeds Kaplan round the team out. If you have questions about the show, a story idea, or a fun fact you want to share, email us at hello at the 10 newscom And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review The 10 News on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Bethany Van Delft, and thanks for listening to The 10 News. Now, go remind your grownups there are only 33 days till Election Day. Vote, 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 vote.